Thanks. Thanks uh, for the great introduction, Pavo. And uh, let me kick off with uh, uh, giving a few reasons why why we want to talk about uh, machine learning or big data processing in ACA or reactive uh, processing. So th the hype is on Spark. So Spark is a uh, mainstream thing. Everyone uses Spark. But I think ACA has a few highlights that I would like to share with you that uh, are making it very good for, for processing uh, data in a reactive manner. Okay. Um, so this is a bit retro. I love retro things. Some of you may like retro things. Some of you might l love new things. But when I when I see this is my fi my first computer actually, and when I when I look at the Commodore 64, of course, it maybe has less processing power than current pro processors, but it has some very nice features. Like when I plug it in, I can immediately start coding. It's like REPL. So this is the the same quality I like about REPL that I got from my Commodore 64. And in that way, retro things are sometimes really good. Okay? This is other thing that, that I really love, is Akka. And this is actually a short introduction to Akka streams. So in streams, we have a source that is producing data. We have a flow that's transforming data. And we have sync that it's consuming data and doing something to the data so that you can actually use it, right? And there is a data flowing from left to right, and there is buck pressure, which is a virtual force, like uh, you know, uh, the uh, like in physics. Okay, so you have this uh, this laws of conservation, and and you have data flowing in one way and virtual force of buck pressure flowing the other way. Um, so. ACA, I think, is, is very suitable to data processing because, because of its architecture. It's very lightweight. It's, um, it allows you to put your online processing blocks um, sorry, in context and lets you concentrate on your data processing logic. So ACA will take care of all the plumbing. So you just plug your algorithm into ACA and start working. The other thing is, in contrast to Spark, Akka is very, very lightweight. But, but you can still deploy Akka in cluster settings. So you can process para in parallel massive data sets with Akka, but you can also run Akka on your mobile phone, on your watch, on anything. It c can be made to run anywhere, and it is very low uh, overhead. Okay, so one of the retro things that ACA has, I've already shown you, is the back pressure. So the back pressure is, is quite universal. This is actually source quench, me quench message from ICMP saying, please stop going so fast. Okay, uh, I cannot process your data. So this is a universal quality, which is very important in processing. Um, the, the other thing I, I really like is what ACA does, this is a SEDA, staged even driven architecture, which, as you can see on the diagram here in, in the left, top left corner, is, is very fast because it processes data in a decoupled stages, which are loosely connected by buffers. So this is also having to do with the back pressure. The back pressure infrastructure in ACA exactly looks like that. You have small buffers bef between each stages, and they act as amortizers, okay, amortizing your data flow so that uh, difference in processing speeds between each component don't get propagated to the rest of the infrastructure and in that way you actually get optimum performance of the whole set and you don't have to care about such nuances as how to deal with too fast or too slow, too slow consumption, too fast propagation of the data. And also, each of the blocks is single-threaded. That's the same abstraction you get in ACA streams. And this uh, actually simplifies your algorithm logic. So your algorithm is, is going to be put into single-threaded context, I if you want. You, you, you can go outside of, the b of this box. But basically, you, you won't have to do any blocking. 
The other thing you might want to use is online algorithms. Okay, so online algorithms, this is also something from the past, but it's a very good thing. So online algorithm processes data as they come. And many algorithms can be easily adapted. This is this is learning from the past, can be easily adapted to be used in the online setting. So for instance, this is a Cadane algorithm calculating maximum subarray problem. What's a maximum subarray problem? You want to find contiguous subarray within one dimensional array uh, of numbers, which has the largest sum. So let's say you have a one big array of numbers. They can be positive, uh, some of them can be negative. So if you had a negative number, then it means that your sum will go down. So you want to process this array and find maximum length uh, maximum sum, contiguous subarray. Looks like a very complex problem. So you think, I would need to get the whole array, start processing it, and th only then I would be able to find the solution. But it seems that it's not the case. It is actually, it has a very simple online solution. So you process data as they come, you register the max ending here, at the moment you, you got, and max so far, and for each element you get, so the max ending here will be maximum from zero and maximum ending here plus this element. So you try this element to put this element on, and max so far would be like max I got this far and max ending here. And this is it. So quite straightforward, right? And this is your basic block. You, you thought out this clever algorithm, or you found it in the literature, and you want to apply it. And ACA will take care of everything else. So you just have data flowing in, solutions flowing out, and your algorithm put in the flow. And this is what we want to show today with Camel. So the flow shape for, for this in ACA, who is familiar with uh, ACA streams programming? Hands up. I'm a bit. All right, great. So maybe it's the basic for you. Right, so flow shape. I have one inlet, uh, I have one outlet, and why I have one flow shape. Shape is, is just a shape, something that's a shape. It, it shapes, it has legs, in legs and out legs, right? And uh, well, inlet, logic, outlet. You put your logic in the context. So what you do for the back pressure is you use abstraction. So suppose you want to build your own stage to pre preserve back pressure. This is the handler for the out, outgoing leg, okay? You, you need to think, in order to create a stage, in terms of, in terms of uh, single element. But actually, ACA will create the buffers for you, and the buffers will be adjusted. Y you don't have to take care about that, you just need to think about one element. So, on pull, so when someone takes an element from the output, because it's out handler, on pull, Okay. You would ask for another element at the input, right? So it flows, okay, maybe it flows that way, right? So element is taken from the output, then next element can be taken into processing from the input. So it's pool-driven development. Quite cool, I think. Um, this is actually interesting thing. I've crossed out two lines, because if you do something wrong in your stages, then your stages will fail. And Aka will tell you that there is a problem. So I, this is some sort of validation logic. I can pull it. So if not has been pulled in, so let's, uh, let's say if I haven't already pulled the in, I can pull it. But actually, if I pull it twice, I will get an error. The, the input that the in has been pulled twice. And this will tell me that something is wrong with, with the logic. So if I do this validation, it might seem better to use the validation, but actually I'm masking logical problems with my stages. So current best practice is don't do it. Okay, so not fail silently. Right, sorry for the small font here. I'm using uh, Cadane logic, this is, this is the one over here, and I put it in, in the context. So on push, was, whereas if I pull, someone pulls from the out. I pull from in, so the element is ready, and I get notification for push. So because I've pulled the element from the queue, 
Now it's going to be pushed into my stage. And on push, I'm just going to do grab my element and process it using my logic and then push it for, for output buffer. Okay? And then someone can pull it from the output buffer and then on pull will be activated. I will pull another element from the input, then on push because it's pushed into the stage. So this push, pull, push, pull. And well, we're talking about creating custom stages here. But uh, Akka has a couple of predefined stages, like uh, stateful map concat, which is actually what we might want to use here. Um, Kadane logic has uh, state. So stateful map concat is actually map a function that ha and c have some state. So map a function with some state. So you might, might want to, to use it here. Um, you might also not want to use it here, but I will get to that later. Right, and the back pressure, back pressure can be applied. So I'm creating in source. I'm uh, this is my Cadane flow stage, the, the one we saw just so. I'm well creating a stream of elements. Then I put them in Cadane flow stage, and then I do this: stop, stop going too fast. And if I did my stage correctly, the back pressure will flow to the source, right? What the source does with it does with the back pressure, it's its problem. So you, you need to look into your source, whether it supports back pressure or just to a degree. Uh, but it's outside of Arca's core, Arca's things. Okay, more complex thing is a bloom filter. A bloom filter can be used to quickly give answers if something is in the dictionary or not. So suppose you have a dictionary, and looking up in the dictionary is quite slow. But it gives you good definite answer, like green check and uh, red no. So yes or no. But you would like to, be to get negative answers faster. So Bloom filter can tell you that something is maybe in the dictionary or definitely not in the dictionary. So like if I put 1 and 5 in the dictionary, so this is like in, incoming stream, I bypass it through the Bloom filter to feed my dictionary, and then have a Bloom filter that I'm asking seven. Do you have seven? And Bloom filter says, no, definitely, I don't have seven. Okay, because it's sure about that. If I asked about one, it would say, probably, I might have one. Then I would just have to ask the dictionary. But basically, if you look at the red and, blue, uh, and, and the green arrows, you have one red input, and one green input, the green for queries, the red for, for the data, and one red output for the data, and one green output for the answers, right? So two legs in, two legs out. Okay, so it looks like I need a special stage for that. Creating stages in Akka is really simple. So this is a simple stage, the, the one that has two inputs and one output. It's like a tree pod. There was a uh, members of a tripod side like many years ago, uh, but I just don't want to talk about that now. Um, and I can easily create this stage in Akka. So I just have a tripod shape, two inlets, one outlet, a bit of code, and that's it. Now, do I really have to do that? No, because a shape is just a shape. So I can find a shape that actually matches that. So fun in shape two is the shape that has two inlets and one outlet and is actually matching this, uh, this sort of arrangement. So I can use it easily. Um, Blue fil filter is more complex. It has four legs. One for inquiries, one for out answers, one for in data and one for out data. And the blue filter sits in inside. And if you look carefully, it's synchronized. So it's single threaded. But, the, but it could propagate its logic outside of the stage. And then you, you might see if, if actually processing data is fast and processing queries is slow, you, you have two streams of back pressure. So back pressure for queries is different from back pressure for data. And this is something very interesting. And still, you don't need to create your own stage because these two stages are homotopic, which means that uh, they have the same shape. A shape is just a shape. And a BD shape is actually, it has two ins and two outs. 
But the BD flow is something completely different. So BD flow is two flows stacked one on each other with two directions. So flow has content, and shape has just a shape. So you, you can just rearrange your legs so that they stick in the order you like to have them. So you can use the BD, BD shape of that. And then I can create a cross stage, which will have just a BD shape, and will have data in inlet, data out outlet, queries in inlet, answers out outlet, and then some logic inside. The logic would be like two back pressures. So I need one handler on push and on pull here. The, the on pull handlers are trivial. Just if pull, then pull. If pull, then pull. The push. So if if I have push here, I just grab element and process it here. And that's it. And here, if I have a push here, then I grab element and then process it accordingly for the data. So I process this how, in the way I'm thinking how to process the data, and this in the way I would like to process queries. OK, so now time for a little demo. OK, I'll try my best, hope. Um, and then I'll show you a small simplification, maybe simplification. Right. So a demo, a demo ran, ran like that. Um, so we have here Bloom filter cross stage. So basically, this is what I was showing you as a BD shape. Bloom filter cross stage has data in, data out, queries in, queries out, and a shape. It has logic which is uh, actually implementation of this shape. And the logic is uh, data in, in handler, would be on push, grab element, filter, this is my uh, bloom filter, this is my state in, in this stage, put the element in the filter, okay? And uh, then push data further, right? These are those checks that we probably shouldn't be doing. The data out, uh, that's that's simple, just for the back pressure. Uh, the queries in, uh, the queries in will have um, on push, I grab query, I check if filter might contain X, and then prepare the answer and push it to the out. And then there is main, and the main is quite simple. I'm just, I just need to put the graph in the context, so uh, I need to create this this thing, and it's from graph. This uh, this couple of uh, thing you, you can find NACA documentation. So in data, this will be this source. In control, this source, and out data I will be printing, and uh, control I will also be printing. And this is for connecting. So in data to cross in one, in control to cross in two, cross out one to out data, and cross out two to out control. Um, let me find Bloom filter cross stage main, and let's play it. You see? Some queries, some answers. So if I look here, I'm putting things. So 720, the filter doesn't contain 505. Um, 100, oh wait, it doesn't, doesn't contain. Probably would have to wait quite a while for the filter to say that maybe it contains something, okay? But I'm pushing one one and the other thing. Uh, the 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 other the other similar similar thing would be having three processor, which would be this is my logic. This is uh, a simple logic, which if I'm giving it examples, it trains incrementally having three classifier. So let train incremental, and if I'm querying it, it tries to run a prediction. But I did a bit. A bit different thing here, namely, I've used standard ACA stuff. Oh, sorry for this, not valid scala. Uh, standard ACA stuff. So, namely, I have two sources: the in examples and in queries. It's just data. So, I'm just uh, examples go from here. This is what I learn, and these are my queries. So, not much here. And what I do is that for the examples which have a type of example, I'm mapping them to a learner query case class with example tag and for queries with a query tag. And then I'm merging them in one stage 
So they both go together. And then my logic is just a simple flow. I actually need to use stateful map con concat because of the state. So I have my state here. This is my state. But for you to, sh to see, I, I added var counter. And if I used a standard map, then it wouldn't work because every time this object will be init initialized and I would get the same, the same state like, um, like in this, this movie about this, this small rodent, which is not capybara actually, uh, that uh, tries to predict weather or something. Uh, okay, uh, so, so this, is, uh, this is basically it. Um, and then I'm just, just getting answers, but I could be then funning out answers. So basing on the answer type, I could unzip them and place into streams. So this would be the same cross, but constructed from standard ACA components. I can run it. Uh, no, that's not that one. I'm terribly sorry. But I have still still chance to improve. So it goes. So I could I could do it that, that, that way. But you see, it learns something. These are the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I put a map here, instead of stateful map concat, I would just uh, be very unhappy. Uh, if you are unhappy that you need to do map concat, then there is uh, stream utils um, stateful map, which I don't know if it's public outside of ACA, but you just can copy and paste the code, which is exactly that thing, and it's quite easy in this stage. Um, all right, and it, it just probably learned it, it learned this and generated prediction. This is uh, the answer. This is the example. So it learned the example. When I asked the same thing, it said one. Okay, for this, for this one, it, it doesn't know this one is a bit different. Uh, it said zero. Uh, I might it. I l learn it also. The problem with this example, there, there is a problem with this example, namely. The problem is that uh, it actually doesn't work with uh, two different types of types of back pressure. So if I use standard ACA components and I merge in a um, multiplexer demo multiplexer to to get simple flow, then there is the same sort of back pressure. So if my queries are slow, then my data processing will also be slowed down which the cross stage doesn't doesn't suffer from okay all right so i think this is end of my part and now over to camille who will be showing uh practical applications uh thank you jan so uh as jan has defined the online algorithms for us uh let's uh, talk a little f about the online machine learning algorithms here uh so there are actually two types of them which are called the statistical models, and these are the ones that you might have heard about. And these are and there are the adversarial models, which no one ever talks about on conferences like this, so let's change it. Um, so as for statistical models, these are your usual online machine learning models, meaning that we, if we have the input variable x and we are trying to predict some y, uh, we know that there is some kind of probability, distribu probability distribution for every pair of x and y at a given moment. We just don't know this probability distribution, and what we're trying to do is to predict y as good as possible. As good as possible, meaning in the light of some function v, which takes our prediction, takes the actual value of y, and gives us a cost that we're trying to minimize. And uh, how can we do that? Well, there is this... Uh, we need to minimize the expected value of this function, which is basically minimizing this uh, little integral equation shown here. And what we're doing for different models is actually we just put different V functions. Uh, like for instance, if you want to have uh, the least squares linear least squares method, you assume that the um, V function is just the square of the difference between the two. Or for the other case, if you put a different V function, you will get uh, support vector machines uh, algorithm here, and so on and so on with most of the uh, popular machine learning algorithms. Now, adversarial models are a bit different that in the way that they treat the learning process differently, meaning that it is envisaged as a game of two players. 
One is the learner, or us, and the other is, uh, let's say, nature, or just an opponent. And the game goes like this. Uh, when the learner gets the input x, he makes his move by uh, predicting y and emitting that prediction. And then the opponent sees your prediction, sees x, and emits the actual value of y. Then, of course, we have the cost. That is the v function here that uh, calculates the loss that we had as a result of the difference between our predicted y and the actual y. And why is that important and actually useful? Because it assumes that the actual value of y, so the opponent's move, may depend on, uh, on the prediction, so our move. And that's often the case in life. For instance, if you play an actual game, right? I don't know, let's say a game of chess, the opponent sees your move before he makes his. Or for instance, if we're deciding whether to buy or sell some stocks on the market, uh, our decision to buy or sell a large number of stocks may actually change their price. So this is pretty realistic. Um, yeah, and now let's go to some actual algorithms that I will show you. And the first one is what we know as uh, recursive least squares. So we all know linear least squares algorithm from our studies, right? Who haven't, hasn't heard about it? Okay, that's good. Uh, <laughs> so if we put in this little integral equation from the other side, you just put the different square of the difference between y and the prediction of y, you get this little uh, uh, formula on the top uh, for uh, linear predictions with least squares. And it's a really good algorithm, it's a solid algorithm, but it has one problem. Its memory complexity is actually proportional to n uh, cubed. So this can be quite a lot, especially if you're, uh, let's say, in a Internet of Things context, for instance, whereas where Akka is a perfectly usable tool. Uh, you might not have that type of memory on your usual Samsung internet-connected freezer, right? But you still need to make your predictions. Uh, so let's try to bring that down a little. And the way is, if you put W as uh, the coefficient in the linear equation on the top, uh, you can actually notice that the formula is recursive. I will not be deriving it here, but just believe me that this is the recursive formula for W. And uh, you might try to derive it yourself after the lecture if you want. Uh, so what we get by recursive here, it means that since it depends only on the earlier w, we can actually run it as an online algorithm, right? Taking inputs and calculating the values as they go. No, I, 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 found it, I, I, just, I just found it. So, so it's not only online, but it's cheaper because it's online. Yes. I really like it. That's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, so what you get here is that actually the memory complexity here is lower. It's n squared. Not ideal, but might just solve your problem in the context that I mentioned. Right? And now let let me try to show you this. Um, yeah. uh, one second, please. So here we have a custom stage, just as uh, in the earlier case. It's actually a fan in shape too that Jan mentioned, so this is a practical application. You have the data input, you have the, say, results input, meaning the actual values that we need to use. Uh, and we have our predictions as an output, right? And then here you have, using the same handler's method, you have the calculation. Uh, which uh, also gives you back pressure on the algorithm, so we have the whole reactive part. And um, uh, I need to go here for one, for one second. Um, so yeah, this is just the earlier formula encoded. And uh, let's maybe run it in, I will run it in debug to uh, show you. The function that is predicted is a very simple one, which is basically just uh, y equals 10x, for the sake of showing it easily. Okay. Uh, um, let's go run it in debug. So all in all, the prediction for the next uh, input should be more or less 10 times x plus 1, right? And we'll see how, how it goes.
Ya van 76. Yeah, sorry. I guess it's just rest. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we have the let's say first prediction, right? And then we can see that the weight here should be approaching 10 with subsequent steps, and it slowly is. Since uh, in this case we have a lot of noise because the noise amplitude is like five, right? So for the 10x function, it's actually pretty. It's quite a lot. So you can see in a few steps we're approaching, slowly approaching the 10 for the weight, right? Yeah, we're already above nine. So this is how it goes. And again, we have this lower memory complexity. And now let me, mm, let me go to the, um, the other example. Okay, so that was it. Um, yeah, almost it. And now I will show you one adversarial algorithm, just for the sake of showing you how it works. So it's called follow the leader, and it's very, very simple. What it does is if you have a set of hypotheses, right, uh, in your adversarial model, and you have past inputs, you just select the one that gave you the best result, meaning the lowest cost for the past inputs. And since this is online machine learning, what we mean by past is we're gonna cache a few of them like a small time window, right? And uh, we always pick the hypothesis that was best until now. And you might see, say this is very simple, so it's probably not gonna work really good. Well, it's true that this algorithm, it's very conservative. It doesn't usually go for the best pick straight away, but also it always stays away from the worst pick. So sometimes you need algorithms like this to, to let's say have bounded loss, right? for cases like uh, where you have to be really careful, like uh, assessing medical costs or uh, let's say managing the investments of a pension fund, you, what's most important for you is not to lose heavily. And this is where this algorithm you could actually lose, uh, you could actually use, sorry. And uh, let me show you how it works also in ACCA. So, um, yeah, the, uh, the, logics the logic works pretty much like this. You have a cached small time window, right? And uh, when you receive new inputs, you run the hypothesis here through, the, uh, through your cached past. Then you elect the leader, and using the leader, uh, you're actually making your next prediction. And what you will see here, the difference in practice between this and let's say recursive least squares is that recursive least squares, it started in first few runs, it didn't do that well, right? It predicted four something, five something. Follow the leader will go to the good pick faster, but then it will take longer to actually go to the optimal pick because it's a conservative algorithm. Um, so, let me then, so let me run it. It's the exact same example meaning the same function is being predicted. And let's see what it will give us here. Okay, so uh, let's finish. Okay, so um, you can see here that uh, you, it's, it's starting to go right to the hypothesis. It's starting to pick quite good hypothesis, but this will not change heavily in the future, right? So for the next one, it it got close pretty fast, but there is, let's say, only slight improvement with the next one. Yeah, and that's pretty much how it works. Um, so that was our presentation today. Are there any questions? That's a stage question, right?
Yeah, so uh, you've mentioned online uh, usage of uh, ACCA streams, but uh, many is the time that we don't use online learning in machine learning whatsoever, given that backpropagation of the error is really, really slow if we have a bigger model and we use the offline one. And uh, how does ACCA streams actually deal with, uh, with back pressure for taking several elements, in fact, because this is what you want to, to use offline learning to really speed up the process of, of updating the weights, of updating the coefficients and stuff. Yeah, I, I think you should, you should uh, what you should do in terms of ACCA, you would need to keep, keep a, like, a byte with a couple of elements, so like a sliding window. So the, 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 the back pressure logic in, in the tooling in, in the ACCA library thinks in terms of one element. So, so if you need, need to, so you can zoom one by one, that this is the, the logic that uh, you know programmer works with. The that's uh, worked differently by, by the library. It just adapts the, the size of the window. But you would need to keep the, the window for, for the data being processed. And then as you, as you slide your window, then new elements would be entering your window. I don't know if, you, if, you, if it answers your, your question. Uh, the, the other way you, you, could, you could run it is uh, like run a more complex setup where you have stages that form a loop. But loops in, in, in ACA, so you, you, you just feed the output of, of a stage into, into a loop. But you need to be very, very careful because loops can easily get stuck or not start. So you'd need to, it's, it's very well documented in the, uh, in the ACA streams documentation, but you need to be very careful where, when you do those setups where that, that feedback. Okay, any more, any more questions? Yes? Yes, yes, so the question was, can this code be found on GitHub? And surprisingly, yes. So, yeah, even in two places. So, um, sorry, my default links are just uh, around our car. So, So this is uh, this is Camille's GitHub, and uh, he has lots of repositories, uh, and I think he just um, just has lots of interesting code, not exactly maybe related only to Akka, but uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the repository on which we work together. You can also find it um, on my GitHub, and uh, there is uh, this code exactly. So it's called Akka Online. Uh, because it is related to ACA and uh, in its online, it's it's not maybe endorsed by by the ACA team, but I just thought that it's it might be a good made made up name. So you can clone it. Um, I don't know, maybe propose a pull request against it. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for one of the examples, the hovding tree, you would need to download the data set. It's just, uh, there is a placeholder, so it's in, and it points you to where, where to download the data set from. Any, any more questions? Well, if there are no, no more questions, thank you very much. I, I hope you enjoyed it.